Praise be Jesus Christ. Welcome to episode 12 of CarmelCast. My name is Father Michael Joseph of St. Therese, and CarmelCast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Studies Publications. For more information, you can go to the website at icspublications.org. And so today we are happy to have back Brother Pier Giorgio of Christ the King. Good to be back. Yeah, thank you. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, Brother Pier Giorgio, actually, he studies German, he studies philosophy, and so we thought he'd be a great one to talk about St. Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, and some of her, her thought and the things surrounding her life. So Again, welcome, Brother Pierre Giorgio, and maybe you could just say a little bit about your own connection with uh, St. Saint, Saint Teresa Benedicta. Yeah, among our saints, um, you know, our Holy Mother, St. Teresa, speaks to all of us in special ways, and she does to me as well. Um, I probably spend most of my spiritual reading, reading St. Teresa of Jesus, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, our foundress. Um, but in terms of the most interest and the most, um, I guess, curiosity and study that I do, um, is definitely focused more on St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, St. Edith Stein. Um, and there are a couple of you know, unique coincidences, I guess, that connect me with her in a special way. And I think our saints have a way of sort of you know, crashing into our lives and, and sort of showing us that um, I think all the saints have this special uh, relationship with, with particular individuals. Um, and I think that's a beautiful sort of understanding of patron saints and things like that. Um, my dad was born in Germany, um, and my grandmother is Austrian, so I've always had sort of this uh, curiosity about um, my heritage, and uh, St. Teresa Benedicta uh, herself, um, she lived for a time in Austria. Mm -hmm. um, she was born in what's today Poland, but at the time was uh, part of the, um, the, the German Empire um, in the town of Breslau, which is now in southwest Poland. Um, but so that sort of very superficial sort of connection, um, she being the German Carmelite saint, um, myself being a Carmelite who has a German um, uh, heritage, mm -hmm. I think that was sort of the first sort of superficial sort of way that I became interested in her. Um, and as I started to read her, um, what really attracted me to her is uh, I love language. Um, I love words and sentences <laughs> and studying how uh, to you know, communicate most effectively in writing. And she really is... Um, a patron saint for writers because she was such an effective communicator and a beautiful writer. Um, so of all of the, the saints um, of Carmel, I love reading her writings just mm -hmm. because of how uh, eloquent she was um, and how much she loved to, uh, to write and to you know, communicate in a way that would inspire people. Yeah. And in fact, uh, part of her career, she, she served as a professor of German mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in the town of... Um, uh, it's, uh, Spire, when she was in Spire, uh, she, she taught German. I was looking at this because this is the, <laughs> the cathedral there in Spire. <laughs> it's a little cheat sheet here for Pastor Georgia. Um, but the, uh, so she had that connection, uh, the love of language, and um, that's another thing that I, I find sort of really inspiring about her and mm -hmm. um, you know, learning to, to be a translator myself. She was a translator. She translated a lot of things into German. Um, we just celebrated the canonization of St. John Henry Newman, mm -hmm. um, and he um, was a very influential uh, theologian. He had, at this time, he had died during her life, or before her life, but uh, um, his theology was, was really popular at the time that she was really getting into the study of Catholicism mm -hmm. as a new convert to the faith. Mm -hmm. And um, so she translated the first, the first person to ever translate Newman into, into German. Um, and her translation of uh, Newman's Saint John Henry Newman's uh, idea of a university was was uh, translated by by Saint Teresa Benedicta and is still the one that's being used. Mm -hmm. um, she also translated into German um, passages of of Saint Thomas Aquinas's writings that had never been translated into German before. Um, so, in terms of her her legacy as as a person, I think there is an area that is rather understudied in terms of her. I mean, we talk about her as a spiritual author, as a martyr, of mm -hmm. course, oh, yeah. um, and as a professor of philosophy, but 
there's that hidden aspect that I am attracted to um, her her uh, career as a translator. Yeah. Well, I think you you said it well. I mean, with especially with that word hidden, because even though she did so much and and had such a full kind of career and full life, she's probably one of our least understood or known Carmelite saints. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe it'd be a good jump off to, to explain a little bit of that. Why do you think maybe she's less understood or, or how, can, how can we get to know her more? Yeah, so there's a few factors. I've heard people, uh, you know, I've given conferences to, um, to lay, lay groups of people, lay, uh, secular Carmelites, lay Carmelites, um, and they're always sort of hesitant when they hear that I'm going to be talking about St. Teresa de Benedicta uh, because they, a lot of people perceive her as, you know, too inaccessible, uh, maybe her, her writing is too hard, too philosophical. Um, uh, yeah, just, just too difficult. Um, and I think there is some truth to that, but it's with anything, if you, if you jump into things that um, are maybe not relevant to what um, that particular person, writer, or saint um, has to speak to you, then maybe, yeah, she won't seem as, as relevant or as coherent to you. Um, so a lot of people will start reading her philosophical writings, uh, writings that she wrote before she even became Catholic and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and kind of be turned off by that. But it's, it's really um, the development of her writing is, um, is such that we have to always keep that in mind when we're selecting a text to read uh, of hers. Yeah. And it might be a good indication, too, to learn a little bit about her first. Yeah, right? of course. Rather than just jump right into her yeah, pre-conversion philosophical writings that yeah. we're not trained for um, to get some kind of taste of who she is. And you know, I think too, even one, one distinction is, what do we call her, right? Yeah. It's, <laughs> you hear it a different, you know, is it Edith Stein? Is it Teresa Benedict of the Cross? Or how, you know, how do you, how do we even understand like what, how we should call her or what the significance of those two names are? Yeah. And this is a, this has a, been a discussion uh, even at, at ICS. Um, we publish her writings as Edith Stein. And the re rationale behind that really is uh, because she was, she was a famous woman even before she became a, a nun, um, and when she was martyred, uh, the after the, the time after that period, people were wondering what happened to her. Um, they were wondering what happened to Edith Stein. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't know. Many of them didn't even know that she'd become a nun. Wow. So it's it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, she had this legacy that she that she cultivated this career. Um, as a teacher um, that really was terminated by uh, the rise of National Socialism in Germany. I think that's another reason why uh, she might be seen as, as uh, inaccessible or maybe a misconception because mm -hmm. there is that, that foreignness to that period of time in Germany. Um, and it's a very important part of, it was, it was the, her life really. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what she was writing, her own autobiography for instance, was written as a response to the rise of anti-Semitism in Germany. Um, she wanted people to see that Jewish families were relatively normal, so she write her, writes her autobiography, Life in a Jewish Family, to talk about, you know, her upbringing and, and the normalcy of her family, and um, that you know that the the Jewish the Jewish people were not anything to be feared or or uh, in in not to be misunderstood either. Mm -hmm. uh, so that this whole aspect of uh, she had this prolific life before she became a nun, before she became. Sister Teresa Benedicta, um, and most of her writing was done uh, before she became a nun as well. Um, mm -hmm. Although some of her most important writings were done uh, as a as a nun, as a Carmelite yes. as well. Yeah. So that's kind of the reason why the two names get confusing. But officially, she is Saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. Yes. Uh, that's, that's what she's canonized as. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it shows, you know, the the different lives that she she lived. Of course, in her, she you know she had a great unity of person, a great unity of vision. Um, but it's one aspect maybe that we can relate to as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think even if she's less understood, but in many ways she's very relatable. Mm -hmm. And and so maybe you could say a little bit about that. Why is she so relatable or how is she so relatable maybe to us today? Yeah, so she her conversion happens at the age of 30 or around that age. Um, and she enters, uh, she enters Carmel at the age of 42. Mm -hmm. So her... Spiritual development is uh, is later in life, right? Um, and in that sense, I think a lot of people can relate to her because um, she's one of the first saints in the 20th century, this modern period that really matches our context today. You know, today we can't take for granted that uh, people are, are educated in the faith at a young age. 
Um, and many people will experience these reversions or conversions or, or, um, or just deep attractions to the faith later in life. Um, and it was a such it was same for her. You know, mm-hmm. she grew up in a secular home, a Jewish secular home, um, but uh, and her mother did uh, go to the synagogue uh, every every Sabbath. But and she celebrated the Jewish high holy days as well growing up. But at that time, you know, the secularization of of Germany happened maybe thirty years uh, prior to her becoming a nun. Um, prior to around the time she was born, in fact, uh, the secularization occurs in Germany, and it just becomes the norm, right, that mm-hmm. the faith is not talked about, yeah. um, and it doesn't become as uh, important in, in, in the culture that she lived in. Um, and I think this ultimately leads, this, this sort of shaky foundation in faith kind of leads to her skepticism mm-hmm. as a young girl. Um, she writes that she prayed most of her, of her young youth, uh, but around the age of she becomes a teenager. Uh, she takes a year off from school and goes to spend um, some time with her eldest sister, who is a, a doctor in Germany or in, in Berlin. And uh, she writes that she stopped praying. Uh, mm-hmm. She sort of just left that that light, that part of her life behind, and she didn't really go back to it until later in life. So she has this journey that she's sort of undertaking. Um, this uh, she wants to she's always seeking for the truth Mm -hmm. and I think that's so much of what we're trying to do Um, even those who have not yet received the gift of faith uh, they're they're seeking uh, for for what is true good and beautiful and that's so much of what uh, her life is an analog for Mm -hmm. she was constantly doing this searching Um, and it didn't come till later she didn't realize till later that she had been searching for God all along Mm -hmm. uh, in this journey yeah and that's what I think a lot of people experience, I mean, even if they're not maybe studying philosophy, but they're trying to find something to hold on to, right. and that's something that's so solid they can base their life on, um, precisely because secularism has sort of taken a lot of that away, right. and, and the possibility for that. Um, so maybe that could be a, a reason, too, why we see this growing interest in her, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is, this is it's, it's a steady growth. It's not something... Um, she isn't the most well-known, but it seems like there are movements kind of getting to uh, embrace her more, or try to go deeper into her thought. Could you maybe say a little bit about that, some of these movements, or what, what's so appealing maybe about her right now? Yeah, so I think the first place that you can turn to is uh, the manner of her death. Mm-hmm. Um, as a martyr, uh, she's declared a martyr um, due to the fact that uh, the Dutch bishops, the country she was living in at the end of her life, um, had made a proclamation that uh, against the the genocide of the Nazis um, and sort of the the mass uh, deportation and ultimate ex- uh, extermination of uh, Jewish and other uh, what the Germans consider the Nazis considered undesirable um, aspects or uh, populations of society, um, they denounced this and and as a result um, the National Socialist regime in the Netherlands. Um, had all of the uh, naturally or the born Jewish but con- converted to Catholicism sort of people uh, rounded up, arrested, and then sent uh, to Auschwitz, mm-hmm. uh, where they were almost immediately exterminated. Um, she's she dies uh, roughly um, eight months or so before um, Maximilian Kolbe um, in the same in the same concentration camp, Auschwitz. Uh, so there's this connection there. I mean, he's a very popular. Uh, 20, uh, 20th century saint. I, I have uh, uh, friends who have named their kids Colby. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, there's this uh, connection with uh, interest in the martyrs of, of National Socialism um, as sort of coping with or un- trying to understand, come to grips with uh, the horrors of the 20th century um, and how faith was constant through the, all of that. Uh, so she's a witness as a martyr uh, to that, to faith um, in the midst of of, of horrendous uh, tragedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a, one, I think, major sort of uh, way that she kind of becomes interested, uh, people become interested in her. Um, that's probably the way that most people initially hear about her is mm-hmm. as a martyr. Um, intellectually, uh, she's, she's growing in popularity. Uh, we recently heard a presentation um, about how the number of, of uh, scholarly articles about her has just been exponentially growing. Mm. Um, in terms of academics, people are studying her writings, her philosophy more and more. 
Um, the school of philosophy, not to get too much into this, but the school of philosophy in which she was a part of, she was a student of, of Husserl, mm -hmm. um, and she studied alongside a man named Martin Heidegger, whose, whose uh, philosophy was very influential in the la later part of the 20th century. Um, he's not as popular now as he was, let's say, 25 years ago. Um, but people are interested in why these two people, uh, Teresa Benedicta and Martin Heidegger, um, studied under the same professor, uh, had the same, um, lived in, in Freiburg in Germany, uh, this, knew the same people, had the same circle of friends, why they were, they came to some di uh, completely different conclusions mm -hmm. about the nature of reality. And I think people are interested in that as well. Um, Heidegger's philosophy kind of goes into a trajectory of atheism, um, whereas, uh, or spiritual realism, uh, or, or rather, Teresa Benedicta's tra trajectory kind of goes towards the way of spiritual realism mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, uh, that God does exist, right? Um, so there's these two, this this uh, this contradistinction people are interested in, right? Why why did this person come to this conclusion? Why did this person come to this conclusion? And try to study that and try to figure out, um, you know, you know, was was she, was she onto something? Mm -hmm. was, does philosophy, does reason have something to say about faith? Yeah. And of course, in in the church, we say that absolutely that the two are are wedded together, and and she. Um, is definitely a saint of, of faith and reason. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that as well, um, a famous encyclical written by uh, St. John Paul II, we're recording this actually on his feast day, which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting, um, St. <laughs> John Paul II, he wrote an encyclical, Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason. And in that encyclical, he actually mentions um, Teresa Benedicta mm -hmm. uh, as a example of how the church should study and should be ex exercise the gift of reason that we've been given mm -hmm. uh, alongside and, and wedded to the gift of faith. Mm -hmm. um, so she's become an example in that way. Yeah. Um, speaking of John Paul II, uh, she, he uh, both beatified and canonized her and declared her patroness of Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually her feast day in Europe is, is celebrated as a feast, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of interesting, right? Is, because yeah. uh, it, I think in the United States, it's not even on the calendar. <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's... Uh, I think she's, in that sense, she's more well known in Europe and European circles, and 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 Americans or uh, English speaking um, people of the English speaking world are kind of late to the game in coming to to know her mm -hmm. and to really see her as as someone uh, worth studying. Yeah. yeah. Well, it could be a very prophetic work, you know. If you think of who's the other co-patroness of Europe, right? Saint Catherine of Siena and right. Saint Bridget of Sweden. Saint Bridget, yeah. So huge saints, right? I mean, yeah. and such an influence. And, and what is that saying then about Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedicta's future role for yeah. us? It's interesting when St. John Paul II chose uh, St. Teresa Benedicta to be a co-patron of Europe, um, he saw the three saints, St. Saint, uh, Brigitte, who came from Northern, from Northern Europe, uh, St. Catherine, who came from Southern Europe, and then uh, St. Teresa Benedicta, who came from Central Europe. Ah. So there's these, this sort of uh, cross... Uh, um, yeah, this cross aspect of, of uniting uh, the European uh, people um, under these patronesses. Um, St. Uh, Brigitte and, and St. Catherine lived roughly around the same time um, and had uh, very actually similar uh, stories in the way in which they were engaged in um, faith and culture in their time, uh, calling out popes. And, and <laughs> um, they both lived during, during the, the, the schism of, between the two seats of Avignon and Rome. Um, and in that, in that sense, too, there's a, there's a correlate or a, a similarity. St. Teresa Benedicta, uh, she wrote to St. Pius XI, um, asking him to write an encyclical about uh, racial discrimination um, and to really uh, go after um, the situation that was happening in Germany uh, before, um, up into and leading into the, the rise of National Socialism. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities there, but really a patroness for our time, a patroness of the 20th century, um, someone who is more relevant. There are people alive today who lived at the same time that she yeah. did. Yeah, I so, think her niece, right, is still right, living. Right, who's written several books on her and knew her very well, you yeah. know, in Germany. Um, so yeah, it's such a close connection, and and even what you mentioned with her her own intellectual path to mm -hmm. the faith, like that's something that's. I don't want to say new in a sense. People have experienced that for a long time, but but it seems to be more common now because people who didn't have a foundation sort of end up discovering the faith through their own intellectual seeking. 
Yeah, so consider our education today. Uh, we have, we're taught science and, and, you know, to be, to always be the scientific method and testing hypotheses and things like that. Um, our catechism uh, studies can, are at times less than can be decided. No, no. <laughs> um, at least I can speak for myself. My own, my own catechism as, as a young person was, I didn't really, uh, it didn't stick with me, right? No, no. It had to happen later. I had to rediscover a lot of that stuff because it, I didn't really internalize it. Um, so I think in that sense, she relates to this. We talked about this in the intellectual conversion, right? Mm. People coming to see um, from the sciences or from, uh, from Protestantism, uh, studying the faith, studying the church, studying history, um, studying the mind, studying the human person. Mm. Um, they come to see, you know, that there is a missing piece there that faith explains that... Uh, that the church has something to say about these things. And I think, you know, she's an example of that. Yes. The ways in which she sought this truth, this, this sort of enigmatic truth. Yeah. Um, and ultimately it led her uh, to faith, to, yeah. con to conversion. And it's amazing because she didn't really, in a sense, have other motives per se. You know, she wasn't engaged to a Catholic man or, right. you know, or some, something that was really drawing her to become Catholic, but that conviction that this is the truth. Right. Right? And in fact, her closest friends were Lutherans. Mm -hmm. So, and some of, some of whom had converted to Judaism, from Judaism to Lutheranism or uh, various Protestant uh, churches. Uh, but yeah, there's that interesting, like, how did, you know, why Catholicism? Yeah. Um, at the time that she, this was all sort of happening, she was staying with a friend, um, Hedwig Martius, Con Conrad Martius was her name, and uh, she was also a female German philosopher, but she herself was Lutheran, um, and for some reason she had a copy of the writing, uh, the autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila mm -hmm. in, her, in her personal home library, um, and it's during this period where, where Teresa Benedicta is staying um, in her home that she, she reads the autobiography of, of St. Teresa of Avila. Um, and is struck. She says uh, she's a, uh, she reports herself to have said this is this is the truth. Yeah. Um, we don't have a a, a, a a complete account of that time, but it would be incredible if we did to really see what was it about yeah. about the, these writings that she that she saw truth in mm -hmm. that ultimately led her to be baptized. You know, not four months later. Yeah, and I think she said too it was that encounter with Saint Teresa of, of Jesus, Saint Teresa of Avila, that. Right at the beginning, she wanted to be a Carmelite, right? Mm -hmm. She just felt so connected to this woman, you know, mm -hmm. from 400 years before, more or less, yeah. um, who was not formally educated, although, I mean, she was a genius in her own way, um, but wrote mostly about her own spiritual experience. And so do th to think that she felt so connected with her, this woman, you know, this, this, this powerful, charismatic woman from, you know, long time ago, very different culture, but that something spoke so much to her that she would want to give her whole life you know, to follow the path that yeah. St. Teresa followed. And it wouldn't happen immediately either. That was 12 years later mm -hmm. from the point of her conversion to the time that she became a nun, entered the Carmel in Cologne. Um, so there's this whole in-between <laughs> time that I think is really yeah. the most fascinating part of her life um, because it's probably the most, uh, the part of her life that we have, um, that she's writing the most, mm -hmm. that, she's, um, that she's the most active in the public, in this public sphere. Um, we know, in fact, that she spoke on on um, the Ger on Bavarian radio, mm -hmm. um, and was instrument was being you know uh, was a well sought after speaker in various uh, places. Um, she was sort of the she was said to be the intellectual leader of the uh, Catholic um, the Catholic women's uh, education movement. Mm -hmm. This I, this uh, thing going on uh, this movement going on in Germany in, during the nineteen twenties and thirties uh, to reform Catholic education in Germany. Um, and she was really seen as as the intellectual leader of that whole movement. Mm -hmm. So she spoke in uh, various conferences uh, throughout the German-speaking world um, about what it is about um, about uh, the women's vo woman's vocation, the woman's spirituality, um, the woman's humanity, really that uh, lends itself to uh, fostering the upbuilding of all people, not just mm. children, but really mm. uh, everyone uh, yeah. in the workplace, in the schools, in the home. Yeah. Um, so that was a big part of her, about her, of her teaching, which she wanted to include. And also she had really this, um, well, I want to say holistic, but it's, you know, that word has some connotations that maybe she didn't would have understood, but this idea of the whole human person yeah. is involved in, um, 
in the formation of human persons. Mm-hmm. Um, so the teacher has to use uh, his or her whole self to, to bring um, the pupils, right, to a better understanding of what's being taught, using their example, using their knowledge, and using just, just the, their presence, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that it's not something separated. Uh, she had a great understanding of the relationship between um, nature and grace, um, that the role of the educator was to uh, to teach alongside the role, the, the grace that's happening uh, yeah. from God, uh, mm-hmm. and to sort of unlock the human potential, uh, the, the human natural potential to receive that grace. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it becomes the role of the educator um, to to cooperate, yeah. to help the individual cooperate with the grace that's being given to them, yeah. to help this help, help them to discover what their natural gifts and talents and abilities are. Mm-hmm. Um, and from there, um, grace can work and build upon nature to really uh, produce excellence mm-hmm. in the human person. So uh, that's a huge part of, of her thinking as well. Yeah, and, and the way that that seems so conducive to her understanding of women, that, mm-hmm. that this is something, it's like, as. St. John Paul II would call the feminine genius that kind of intuits this and, and right. has this capacity to be able to educate in this way and, and uh, walk alongside people in this way. Um, could you maybe say a little bit then about her own influence on current Catholic understandings of, of the role of woman and, and the vocation of woman in the church, in the world? And... Yeah, so uh, well, to back up a little bit, she um, her understanding, she she firmly believed that women could do could could be uh, successful in any profession, mm-hmm. um, which was, I think, rather uh, early for her time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we have to consider that around the time of her conversion, uh, women are just being able to vote in the United States. Yeah. So this is, she's contemporary with that. Yeah. And uh, and so this notion that women can do any, any profession successfully, uh, she, she really sort of, um, Develop that alongside that uh, the idea that there are but there are certain professions where women uh, Particularly exceed and the ones that she mentioned of course are education like we mentioned mm-hmm. um, and I think taking a, a, um, An example from her own elder sister uh, the medical profession her, her sister was an OBGYN um, and So there's, there's this there's this notion that uh, the feminine soul particularly uh, is successful at cultivating uh, the human person and one, one way, both both sort of uh, sorry, but medically, right, mm-hmm. um, or formationally, in those giving those two examples. But uh, what's interesting is that she takes uh, the example of Our Lady, right, mm-hmm. um, that Mary um, is given the vocation of the protector of the humanity of Christ, mm-hmm. um, and in that sense, uh, she sees the anal- analogous sort of relationship or role of. The woman's vocation to protect humanity, mm-hmm. uh, the humanity of, of the indiv- of, of one's children, the humanity of um, others that we work alongside in the workplace, um, protect the humanity in any sort of sphere of life. Right. Mm-hmm. This is important for her, uh, for her understanding. Um, so, alongside that, so a big, I guess, alongside that idea is this notion of um, complementarity mm-hmm. between the feminine and the masculine. Um, and this is an idea that gets picked up uh, through um, uh, several steps by St. John Paul II in his Wednesday audience, address, uh, audience address, addresses on the theology of the body, mm-hmm. these catechetical uh, teachings um, from 1979 until I can't remember when they ended, but yeah, yeah. It's, several years, <laughs> it's, I think. it's several years, somewhere <laughs> in the 80s. Um, you know, Saint Teresa Benedicta is is in that uh, we we know there's a connection because her good friend Roman Ingarden, who was a professor um, of philosophy in Poland, taught alongside uh, who would become Saint John Paul II, uh, Pope John Paul II, Karol Wojtyla, when he was a professor of ethics um, at a, at a, the University of Lublin in in Poland. So there's a connection there. Um, but that's how that's where he discovered her and learned about her anyway, and and started reading uh, her her writings. Mm-hmm. Uh, in German, so there's this unique connection of how she kind of comes through with this idea of complementarity of the sexes that gets picked up so much in uh, Saint John Paul II's theology of the body. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's an interesting sort of way that she's influential in that sort of uh, area of, of Catholic intellectual thought. Mm-hmm.
just just say a little bit about my own experience with her. Um, I found it very helpful to get to know her as a person first um, before kind of maybe going into some of her other writings. And for me, that that yeah, she kind of came alive in a new way when I got to know her. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you? How would you maybe recommend for others who want to get to know her better, or or to maybe start the process of getting to know her or her thought? Yeah. So I think that the the where I started and where I think many people have started are different short biographies about her written mm-hmm. by either people living today or who knew her. Um, I think those are good ways to sort of get to know you know her life, her story, the story of her conversion. All those things are very interesting. Um, but I can't stress enough, can't recommend enough that you actually dive into her own writing. Like, Because like I said, her writing is just so rich. Yeah. Um, she's a fantastic writer. Mm-hmm. Um, and for that, I, I would recommend her autobiography. Um, this is Life in a Jewish Family. Uh, she didn't finish it. Uh, she gets up to uh, around the time r- right before her conversion. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's unfortunate that we don't get to hear you know, the whole story, but uh, just the way that she makes her family come to life come alive. Her mother, uh, this strong figure in her life, uh, was really remarkable. Um, a, she was a widow and uh, ran a, a, a lumber yard. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can imagine the turn of the century, this, this, uh, this, strong, this strong woman, uh, middle-aged woman uh, running this lumber yard, um, it's, it's quite, you know, quite impressive and remarkable. Yeah, with a bunch um, of kids, too, to take care exactly, of little yeah. Edith. Yeah. So uh, it, she really makes her, her family come to life. She tells stories about, uh, one of my favorite passages in this book is when she talks about uh, going to Göttingen for the first time where she studies uh, in university. Um, and uh, she talks about going on hikes with her friends. Um, she tells a story of when she was in high school, how she, te- she helps her, her, uh, her classmates cheat on a test. So <laughs> yeah. she's very, you know, very relatable and very, uh, she, she doesn't hide anything. Oh. Um, she, it's very real and she doesn't, uh, yeah, she doesn't sugarcoat mm-hmm. anything. Yeah. Um, she tells a beautiful uh, story of a period of her life where she was a nurse mm-hmm. during World War I, a first uh, a, a Red Cross nurse um, in Austria during the, during the First World War and uh, just how she, uh, trained to be a nurse and and how this became she basically put her doctoral studies on yeah. on hold and yeah. she was writing her dissertation you know in this hospital <laughs> uh, near the front lines of, of the war um, so just incredible stories um, and it just her, her writing comes alive yeah uh, and then the other book I would recommend is uh, one that we kind of got into today her essays on woman um, this is a Relatively accessible book. I mean, it, it's a series of, of conference talks she gave, so they're they're more or less um, things that she presented to people. Um, it really talks about her. I think it gives a good introduction uh, through the lens of of uh, femininity, of teaching, mm-hmm. um, of the vocation of teacher. And I think anyone who is a teacher or who um, assists in f- formation or faith formation in any way would benefit from reading this book. And would be inspired by it as well. Um, so those two would be great places to start, I think, for, for both getting to know her and then also getting to see a little bit of her writing and, and what her contributions are to, to the church today as yeah. an intellectual. Yes, definitely. And a lot of those were talks, right? I mean, the essays on women were talks or presentations she gave. Right. So it's not going to be the same sort of heavy philosophy that you might find right. in a couple of her other works. Or, right, yeah. So She's... she's, she's Presenting, she's talking. She's not. Uh, she's not systematically sort of, you know, covering everything. Yes, right? it's it's yeah. very much uh, short uh, to the point. You don't want to bore people in a presentation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't want to. No guarantees, but <laughs> no. That's that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, um, I don't know. Do you do you have anything you'd want to share? Maybe a little bit from her writing. Yeah. So I I brought one quote, um, and this is a I think one of the more famous parts of, uh, of her life leading up to her conversion. Um, this is after the, world, the First World War. Uh, she's visiting, visiting her friend Pauline Reinach, um, whose husband has just passed away or died in the war, was killed in action. And uh, she goes to, to Frankfurt uh, in, in the central part of Germany to basically, she thinks she's going to console her friend who has become a widower. Um, but what ends up happening is that uh, the, her widowed friend ends up consoling her. Yeah. Um, just sort of complete, uh, unexpected um, turn of events. Um, 
But uh, one thing she talks about is traveling around the city, seeing the sights of, of the city of Frankfurt. Uh, they go into the cathedral. At this time, she's not, she's not a Catholic. Um, they go into the cathedral of, of Frankfurt, and she, she relates a story of something that stuck with her for the rest of her life. So I'll read that, and okay. you'll get a sense a little bit about um, of some of, of what you know, occurred to her yeah. in her life. We stopped at the cathedral for a few minutes, and while we looked around in respectful silence, a woman carrying a market basket came in and knelt down in one of the pews to pray briefly. This was something entirely new to me. To the synagogues or to the Protestant churches, which I had visited, one went only for services. But here was someone interrupting her everyday shopping errands to come into this church, although no person was in it, as though she were here for an intimate conversation. I would never forget that. Great way to end. It's a great way to end. And it shows, too, the power of simple faith that this woman had no idea that she would have that kind of influence on. Yeah. But just by living that day-to-day -day faith, that, that how powerful that was for, for St. Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedicta. Yeah. So, are you good? Well, thank you, Brother Peter George. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> good stuff. Get to know her more. There's actually a YouTube video. Um, it's a docudrama on Edith Stein, if you're interested. If you just look up Edith Stein docudrama, it'll probably come right up and it's it's very well done it's very powerful so we can put the right. link in the in the description of the podcast too. okay cool cool hey everyone brother Pier giorgio here thanks for checking out this episode of carmel cast if you want to hear more of us don't forget to click subscribe also be sure to click like if you enjoyed this episode and maybe even leave us a comment we post discussion questions down below to get the conversation going. Want more information on Carmelite spirituality and the Discalced Carmelite Saints? Then you'll want to check out our website, www.icspublications.org. There's a link in the description of this episode. From here, you can see all our current promotions and access our complete catalog for the writings of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, and St. Edith Stein. If you want to stay up to date on all our promotions and new titles, then be sure to add your email to our email list. There's no better way to stay up to date on the latest Carmelite publications. Thanks for joining us, and may God bless you.